Today, a Canadian beef industry conference special with Brennan Turner on the grain markets. Deborah Murphy here. I'm at the Canadian Beef Industry Conference, joined by Brennan Turner, who's an independent grains market analysis. Brennan, I usually run into you at events like, you know, farm tech or commodity groups in the cropping sector. What brings you here? Well, um, obviously, grain markets are something that impacts beef markets and, and specifically on the, what we call it the input side, I guess you could say. And so trying to give some sense of what's going on in the markets. A lot of volatility these days, the last you know, two years essentially, what's going on in the US in terms of um, you know, some of the, the crop production challenges there. Obviously the Black Sea being a major asterisk and, and everything these days between Ukraine and Russia and the invasion. Um, and then last but not least is, is some of the recession and inflation challenges that we might be facing and how does that impact potentially commodity prices. So here to chat with producers and you know, mixed farmers as well in terms of you know, how, to, how to, to, to kind of think about some of the seasonal trends, uh, anticipate things, whether it be selling grain or even buying grain. And so um, just giving some, some kind of timelines to think about for, for each side of the equation in terms of when, when it might be optimal to either sell or buy. So I think you, what we'll do is we'll talk about different crops and you'll probably mention all of the problems that you, you briefly spoke about now, but let's start with barley. What's it looking like uh, for this year's production and for prices going forward? Well, I mean, the biggest thing is like, it's no surprise or secret to anyone that barley prices have been at record highs basically, right? On the feed side of things. So, um, you know, that's a function of last year's drought. And, and probably the biggest factor to think about is the reality that acres actually dropped about 1.25 million this year compared to last year. So a lot more acres into wheat, a lot more acres into canola instead, uh, some pulse crops obviously, but the bottom line is that you know, we're not necessarily gonna see a massive production number um, like you would normally anticipate after a, 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 a record high year because hey, all crop prices are really high and so what's the easiest to grow, what's best for my rotation, a lot of factors that go into it. Um, all things being equal, feed barley prices today are actually below where they were a year ago, so it could be a, a net positive. Um, and, and I think that while yields will definitely rebound, I don't know if they're going to be um, next to the, the kind of the seasonal average or, or long-term trend lines that some of the government forecasts are, are predicting today. Um, that, that in mind, the reality is that we are in a very low stocks environment, record low stocks in fact, the last year and predicted to be this year. So um, as a result, there's going to be a high price environment that continues. Again, this is not necessarily just for barley, but a lot of crops, so that impacts where things are gonna be. So you know, in terms of, in terms of buying feed uh, barley, there's some, some great opportunities in the, in the early kind of winter months, that November to December timeframe. Thereafter, it becomes very volatile as barley starts to fall, some of that corn price action. And uh, corn prices, they just tend to be a lot more volatile in January, February, March, April. As there's questions about South America, what are we going to plant in the U.S. this year, so on and so forth. So tell us more about corn. I guess well, that's where we can go next because uh, we haven't figured out when to buy our barley, potentially. <laughs> well, it's, it's a similar dynamic with corn. I mean, once, once um, you know, the crop is basically known in North America and even in the Northern Hemisphere, including Europe, Black Sea, which is a big issue in itself, um, then we can kind of understand that, okay, supply is relatively known. What is demand looking like? So corn prices tend to be fairly flat in, in, you know, it starts to peak out around that, again, November, kind of December, January timeframe. Before then, the question marks of what is the Brazilian crop in South America looking like? Um, what are we going to plant this coming year? And I think right now, I think the, the, the size of the U.S. corn crop is pretty, pretty much priced in. The USDA said in their, their August WASDE report a couple of days ago that uh, average yields in the U.S. should be about 175.4 bushels per acre. But in the last couple of weeks, it's been really hot in the Midwest as well as many other places. And in Iowa alone, you've seen their crop conditions. The, the, the percentage of the corn crop rated good to excellent drop. By, by literally nine points. They, it, three weeks ago, it was at 80%. Now it's it's literally in the 60%. Um, um, South Dakota in a kind of a similar dynamic. And so the USDA was initially predicting record yields in Iowa, 
Is that going to happen? I don't think so. A lot of other people don't think it's going to happen. So we might be at the highs in terms of what the projected crop size could be in the US, but it's not just the US, it's Europe as well. Europe's been facing their own drought challenges. And again, in the last lost report, the USDA lowered their production product potential of corn by literally 8 million metric tons. France, biggest example, um, literally a month ago, their good to excellent ratings for corn was 80%. Today, it's 50. So that's not, that's not insignificant. And so if you, again, you think about what we're able to produce, the, 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 the most amount of supply has basically been priced in. And so arguably prices should trend a little bit higher. Keep in mind that corn prices do tend to trend higher from kind of that September up to the November timeframe before starting to plateau a little bit. Probably the biggest asterisk though will be Ukraine, right? We have this new grain corridor that boats of grain, wheat, barley, corn are starting to flow through. And the market is currently pricing in somewhere between three to five million metric tons per month of, of exports of all the, the different products that, that Ukraine is, is usually exporting through the Black Sea. But the reality is that that's not happening. Three to five million metric tons is a, is a dream and a pipe, you know, it's, like it's, 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 it's inconceivable relative to what's actually happening right now. I think that we'll probably top out at maybe one and a half, maybe two million metric tons. And so as a result, that uh, demand is going to have to go somewhere else. Maybe the U.S. again, maybe uh, parts of, of South America. But the point is that, that there's a little bit of musical chairs that's going to go around. As a result, prices should level up a little bit higher. You mentioned drought in different areas across the world. How is Canada looking? You know, where we get kind of stuck in our little silos and, and enjoying the rain. How is it across the country? Yeah, the front window syndrome can be real, right? Um, I, you know, the, the reality is that we, again, we're still coming back from last year's drought. Um, continue to be very dry. Like my family down in southwestern corner of Saskatchewan, um, still very dry relative to the long-term averages. On the flip side, the family on east central Saskatchewan and Manitoba, you know, we basically almost had 200% normal uh, moisture this year, uh, just given the really rough spring. And as a result, that pushed our, our seeding plants back by about two to three weeks. So, you know, it's going to be a little bit touch and go near harvest time. But, you know, we're feeling pretty optimistic about where crops are. I think the closer you are to the U.S. border, um, if you're not on irrigated land, the, the yield potential has definitely dropped over the last number of weeks, unfortunately. Um, and I think that's not just in Canada, but also on that, those kind of those border areas, North Dakota, Montana, et cetera. So, um, you know, again, the, the potential of the size of the crop and its potential has probably been maxed out at this point. And, and we'll get some of the first estimates from Statistics Canada um, later in August. And then again, two weeks later in the middle of September in terms of their updates. So um, that'll probably move the markets. But hey, we're on the harvest low. Supply, new supply is coming to market. And if I'm thinking about securing inventory, um, you know, doing so before the end of September through the winter months might be a good time to do so. Um, and then again, probably in that November, December timeframe for maybe the rest of the year. You mentioned that barley is some of the, the acres have moved over to crops like corn, which we talked about in wheat. Uh, will that help with pricing in the wheat markets for people buying? Yeah, potentially could. Um, I think that the challenge will be knowing indeed, like, what is this year's quality looking like? We know that, again, because things were a little bit late um, in, in, in parts of Saskatchewan and Manitoba, the quality of the crop could be impacted by a wet or late harvest, right? We've seen that in years past, not a lot of disease issues, obviously can't necessarily just feed disease riddled crops to, to animals, that's not gonna result in, in good production. But um, I think that there, there is, there's a big significant rebound in wheat, but the challenge is that there's just a strong demand uh, globally for wheat, whether it be low protein quality or, or high quality, you know, in terms of the hard red spring wheat that, that can, Canadian farmers are, are famous for being able to produce uh, safely. So, uh, you know, it, basically this will be the fourth consecutive year where global ending stocks will start to, to will continue to go down. So basically we are producing not as much as consumption. And, and so again, that's what is supporting wheat prices. But probably the biggest variable is what's happening in Europe in the Black Sea specifically. We don't know, again, is Ukraine going to be able to export as much of the 20 million metric tons that was supposed to get shipped out in the last half of the crop year, that's just been sitting there. It's just been idle. What's the quality of it now that it's been sitting there for so long and not aerated or turned on and whatnot? Like there's so many question marks 
And, and so things could go either way. But I think one of the biggest factors that a lot of um, market analysts and, and even government officials or even producers are not even thinking about is will Ukrainian farmers be able to get this false crop in? Um, the, the, the challenge of labor, the challenge of fuel, the challenge of crop inputs and securing seed. Um, those all account for, for you know, hurdles for farmers to, to jump through or over. But probably the biggest one is the financing. I'm hearing interest rates of 25 to 30 percent in Ukraine right now to secure some of these realities or some of these these needs. And when you have that sort of cost of, of putting the crop in, I mean, cognizant that this year's crop was the most expensive that we've ever planted in our history. The reality is that it's unprofitable for these farmers to plant corn or uh, wheat or barley in the fall. And so because most of Ukraine's production is fall based or, or winter based cereals, there's a lot of, of, of potential that the, that production will, or those acres just won't get seeded. Um, and instead, farmers will just produce instead rapeseed, winter rapeseed, because that market is relatively secure. It's either getting uh, railed or, or trucked into Europe for biodiesel needs. And uh, instead, of, instead of growing a crop well, that's usually getting exported through the Black Sea, which is, again, unsecure, it'd be the equivalent of, of basically saying, why would you plant... Um, wheat or barley when the majority of your wheat or barley goes to the port of Vancouver and Vancouver is closed. And so farmers in Ukraine are basically making the decision based on what A, they can secure supplies for, and then B, where they know they're going to have market access. And, and so this is probably the biggest variable that's not really being discussed, um, but it could push wheat prices you know, fairly significantly higher in the fall, depending as well on how much speculators and, and hedge funds and managed money jump into the market if they think that's going to uh, impact where the long-term value of wheat is going to be. There are so many question marks. You've mentioned very a whole bunch of different sources. WASDA, which is the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates, um, StatsCan, and then the markets themselves. What what do we watch? I mean, this it sounds like a full-time job. Uh, <laughs> what, what do we watch in order to get a good eye of all of this and keep up to date? I think, I think this comes down to controlling what you can control. It, it has not, you, you can't control what you know, Vladimir Putin is going to decide or, or what Mother Nature is going to be able to, to provide for us this, this fall and, and harvest. And so understanding when your bills may be coming due, understanding when your, your inventory of, of feed supplies might be running out, getting in front of that, be proactive. As, as a new load comes in, maybe set a reminder for yourself another week from now in terms of uh, securing a, a couple more loads potentially. Control the factors that you can control you, and focus on those. If you spend mental energy and your time and effort on things that you can't control, then you're being distracted and, and that's going to negatively impact the other factors that you can control and the, the time and energy and, 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 and mental capacity that you're able to commit to those things. So um, it's really about... Kind of trying to trying to understand a your cost of production again whether that be on the on the, on the production side of, of grain or the production side of cattle, um, understanding when some of the best times to go to market for either selling cattle or buying feed are going to be. I've mentioned kind of those that November December time frame is maybe an optimal time to secure supplies as well as rate of harvest. Now that hey there's new supplies coming to market, but. Um, Putting together that list of, of these are the things that I can control and going back to the list and don't get deviating, don't get distracted by those shiny objects that you see in the headlines per se because they're, they're eventually just noise that everyone likes to talk about but it doesn't necessarily impact you on a day-to-day -day basis. Think about what you can control. It's the best advice I can give. Brennan Turner, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me.